Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for your kind presentation. First of all, I would like to, to thank the Gini Initiative for inviting me to participate in the second uh, summit. And I would like to, to apologize because the, the change in the program was due to a, a technical problem I had with my presentation, and I hope it will work now. And the, the aim of this presentation is to address some results we obtained in a, a project that was supported by the European Union that is called the, the Helena, Helena study. First of all, I would like to, to highlight that yogurt is one of the food items or food categories within the dairy products uh, food group. And I think, as the, the previous speakers already did, we should consider a yogurt intake in the context of milk and dairy products intake and also their relationship with human nutrition in general. And this is the, the portrait of a recent document published by FAO that I recommend you to read it because it's very relevant and very interesting. But going to the, to the topic of my, of my presentation, one of the main uh, uh, problems, public health problems, and also a, a cardiometabolic uh, risk factor is obesity in children and also in, in adolescents. And just to remind you that when we are talking about obesity, obesity is an excess of body fat, what in theory is, is very clear, but in practice, we don't have adequate methods in order to, to define uh, or to measure this excess of body fat, and even less, we don't have adequate cutoff values to define the excess of body weight. In any case, obesity in, in children and adolescents is a very relevant problem because this is not just an excess of this tissue, it is associated already in children and adolescents with complications affecting almost all the organs and systems in our body. Probably the most uh, frequent complications are the psychosocial ones, but probably the most relevant in the long term are cardiovascular complications like hypertension or dyslipidemia and the endocrine complications, especially the development of type 2 diabetes. In this context, very often, we used to talk about the metabolic uh, syndrome, even if this is discussed and even more discussed in children and adolescents. But in general, I recommend to include different complications, cardiovascular and uh, endocrine complications of, of obesity, like insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, dyslipidemia with elevated triglyceride levels and low HDL cholesterol concentrations, glucose intolerance and or type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. In this regard, we can classify individuals, or children and adolescents, as having the metabolic syndrome, or another strategy used mainly in epidemiological studies is to compute a quantitative score of the risk of complications related with the cardiovascular diseases. In relation with, with obesity, this was already commented in the previous presentations, and in the case of obesity in children and adolescents, and as a background, we had the opportunity of review, reviewing the role of different dietary factors and food habits in the development of obesity, and one of the conclusions what that was that available evidence does not allow recommendations on, on the role of calcium or dairy products in the development of obesity. This was published in 2011. It's a position paper of the ESGAM Committee on Nutrition that was led at that time by Ranan uh, Shamir. And this is also the conclusion of another very recent uh, review on the role of the daily products intake in children and adolescents and the relationship with some uh, uh, health outcomes. And one of the conclusions 
was that despite concerns that energy provided by dairy may contribute to childhood obesity, that was an idea that was in the scientific literature, evidence presented in this review overwhelmingly supports a null or inverse association between milk or dairy product intake and indicators of adiposity. So this is the, the context of the, the study we, we perform or the analysis we perform in the frame of the ELENA study. And the objective was to investigate the relationship between dairy consumption in general and cardiovascular diseases risk factors in a sample of adolescents aged 12.5 till 17.5 years from eight European cities particip participating in the cross-sectional ELENA study. Of course, we will uh, address the limitations that are always linked to the cross-sectional designs, but you will see that we uh, make some observations that can be useful mainly to design future studies. The HELENA study, as I already mentioned, is a cross-sectional study that was performed in 10 European uh, cities from the north uh, Stockholm to the south uh, Heraklion, for instance, and from the east uh, Pech in Hungary to the west uh, Lille or Zaragoza in France and Spain. So we had nine countries, 10 cities, because in Greece we assess uh, adolescents from Athens, but also Heraklion, where the Mediterranean diet was described in the 1960s. And the aim was to recruit at least 350 uh, adolescents per city, and at the end, in between 3,000, 3,500 adolescents. And from the beginning, because we were planning to, to make an extensive assessment of the nutritional status in the blood, we decided to only uh, obtain blood samples in one third of the total uh, study sample. Uh, so at the end, in between 1,000 and 1,200 adolescents. So at the end, in, in reality, we were able to recruit 3,528 adolescents, 1,845 females, and 1,683 males. And we uh, obtain information in relation with different dimensions, for example, for, for diet, eating attitudes, nutrition knowledge, etc. but we obtain dietary intake using the ELENA diet software for repeated 24-hour recalls, and the aim was to obtain two 24-hour recalls, one from a weekday and one from a weekend day. So the adolescents were filling the questionnaire in the computer room, and we had also a lot of pictures, just uh, a parenthesis to say that no one of the countries participating had English as the uh, mother uh, language. All the materials were developed in English because it, the, it was the only common language, but we don't have versions in, in English, for example, of the, of the software, and this is the version in, in Spanish, as you can see. So we have different uh, foods. Uh, we have also reminders, for example, in relation with water consumption, milk consumption, butter consumption, etc. And what was more important was that we had different portions, so adolescents uh, selected the portion they uh, uh, remember they ate the previous 24 hours uh, to make the, the, the recall. So this is, for example, a classic Spanish uh, recipe. And we did validation of, of the tool here in this paper we describe the development and evaluation of this 24-hour uh, recall. It is important to highlight that the, we consider 31 food groups that were the, uh, the target for the analysis we did for this presentation. And we also did a validation. I don't have time to, 
to go into the details, comparing the uh, food and nutrient intake and concentration biomarkers in these adolescents. Focusing on, on dairy products, we consider four groups, as you can see here, milk, including milk and buttermilk. The second uh, group was yogurt, milk and yogurt-based beverages, including yogurt, yogurt and milk beverages, like chocolate milk, milk and probiotic beverages, and also white cheese, also cheese, and milk-based desserts. And in our study, no distinction was uh, done on the fat content in any of these food groups. Of course, we assess uh, body composition using anthropometry, weight, height, skin folds, and also circumferences, but also bioelectrical impedance, and we did some methodological uh, work using air displacement plethysmography. As it is a multicenter study, it was important to, to assess the reliability of the measurements. This is especially relevant for the skin folds, and we can see here the intra-observer reliability that was in all the cities higher than 95%, and probably more, more difficult was to have a good inter-observer reliability, and here again, for all the skin fold thickness, as an example, we had a reliability that was higher than 90%. We also assess cardiorespiratory fitness, because as we will see later, it's one of the items that is included in one score we computed using the 20 meter shuttle run test, and we we did already some publications in this, in this regard. And we obtained an important set of biomarkers from the most uh, uh, typical, glucose, for example, cholesterol, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, but also, as you can see, insulin, uh, different vitamins, etc. With all these variables we measure, at the end, we compute a continuous score of cluster cardiovascular diseases risk factors as it was suggested in this publication in 2006. So the variables we consider were systolic blood pressure, the sum of four skin folds we measure also in our study, triglycerides uh, serum concentrations, the ratio of total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol, the HOMA index, and also cardiorespiratory fitness. So we computed first sex-specific set scores, and then uh, we added up all the results of the set scores of the different variables. For the statistical analysis, we use first discriminant analysis to distinguish participants at high and low cardiovascul cardiovascular diseases risk according to the distribution of food consumption. And when we started this uh, analysis, we used the stepwise method, including all the food groups, the 31 food groups that were entered simu simultaneously. And we observe that in comparison to the rest of the food groups, milk and the uh, food group yogurt, milk and yogurt-based beverages show it the highest standardized canonical discriminant coefficients and accounted for a very important variability for the majority of the cardiovascular diseases risk factors in both males and females. For this reason, we decided to focus in these two food groups, milk and yogurt. So we, we continue with the analysis. I am going to, to summarize. We perform multiple uh, linear regression, also one-way analysis of, of covariance, and we consider as confounders something it's important in adolescence, pubertal maturity, socioeconomic status, of course, and other lifestyles that could be also related with the risk of cardiovascular diseases as moderate vigorous physical activity, sedentary behaviors, 
energy intake uh, at least. So at the end, because we needed to have adolescents with complete measurements of all these variables, we were able to analyze 511 uh, subjects, 49.9 boys, and we compare this uh, specific sample with uh, the complete sample in which we obtain uh, blood, and we didn't observe significant differences for, for example, age, weight, height, and body mass index. So we are coming to the to the results. Here uh, we can see the standardized regression coefficients examining the association of the food groups, uh, milk, then yogurt, and then we added up milk plus uh, yogurt and yogurt-based uh, beverages uh, intake on or in relation with the cardiovascular diseases risk factors here, and this is already published in pediatric obesity, and we observe an inverse association between the, these food groups and some indicators of body composition. If we focus on, on girls, we can see that especially the yogurt group was associated and the association was higher when we added up uh, milk to yogurt and yogurt-based beverages, and this was for uh, set the score of body mass index, waist circumference, and the sum of skin folds. We also observe, and this was also very interesting for us, a positive association between especially the yogurt group, but also the combination of the two uh, food groups with cardiorespiratory fitness. And in girls, we observe a negative association with triglyceride serum concentrations. And also, and but only in girls, we observe a negative association between these food groups and the cardiovascular diseases risk score, including all the variables I presented to you before. We also perform an analysis classifying the adolescents according to their tiles of consumption of the different food groups. Here, uh, milk, and you can see that, for example, for waist circumference, there was not any significant uh, uh, difference. But when we consider uh, the group of yogurt, adjusting for these variables, we observe a significant difference in girls between uh, adolescents being in the tertile one and those being in tertile two of yogurt consumption. And when we consider the overall daily consumption, we also observe or we observe a stronger association always in uh, girls for waist circumference and also for the sum of skinfold thickness. And finally, for the cardiovascular diseases risk score, when we consider milk or yogurt as separate uh, food groups, we found some associations, but this association was uh, stronger when we consider the overall daily consumption, because those being in the tertile one had a very or quite high cardiovascular diseases risk score, and those in tertile three this uh, score was uh, lower. But we had also the results of the complete sample of the study, and this could be relevant to address the specific topic of, of obesity or body, or body composition. So taking into account that we were planning to make this presentation, we did a supplementary analysis that is not included in the in the paper. So the, the requirement here was to have adolescents with complete measurements on uh, body composition and also dietary intake. At the end, we had a sample of uh, uh, 1,422 adolescents, uh, 
close to 45 boys. And again, there was no difference between this specific sample and the complete sample in terms of age, weight, height, and body mass index. And here we obtain uh, similar results. For example, for the set score of BMI, there were clear differences in girls between those consuming the overall uh, dairy from tertile one to tertile three. And this was also the case for waist circumference here, both in boys and in girls, and for the sum of skin folds here, also in this case, in boys. So these are the results we, we obtain, and as I already showed to you at the uh, beginning of the presentation, there was a recent uh, review on the topic of, of the relationship with, with obesity, and the summary of this review, they uh, uh, describe that there were 35 observational and intervention studies that were included in the, in the review, and 34 reported null or inverse associations between daily intake and different indicators of body composition and energy balance. There were five randomized control trials and four found no association between daily intake and measures of adiposity, always in children and adolescents, and one found an inverse association. And it is important also to highlight that 23 of the 35 studies, the majority, were uh, obtained in the U US. So we need also to perform analysis in, in Europe and in other uh, regions. And of course, it is important to consider the potential mechanisms to explain these results. Some of them were already uh, commented by uh, Professor Tremblay, but the first one is the, the replacement of uh, some foods uh, by others. The potential effect also of, of dietary uh, calcium that is suppressing calcitriol and calcitriol stimulated influx of calcium into the adipocytes and potentially inhibiting lipogenesis and promoting lipolysis. Another potential mechanism is through the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitory peptides in whey protein, protein that stimulate adipocyte lipogenesis. Dairy proteins, they were already mentioned, that potentially uh, support better the synthesis of proteins in the muscles than plant foods, and by this uh, way could enhance anabolism and potentially increase energy expenditures, expenditure, sorry, specific amino acids, and also, for, for example, the presence of conjugated linoleic acid in dairy, in dairy products. So to conclude, in this cross-sectional study with all the limitations of this uh, design in European adolescents, we observe an inverse association between yogurt, milk, and yogurt-based beverages and some cardiovascular diseases risk factors, especially excess total and abdominal body fat. The association was stronger when we added up milk intake. In my opinion, there is a need of having observational studies considering yogurt as an individual food category, what is very often missing. And of course, we need also randomized control trials to provide evidence supporting these findings and also trying to understand the specific mechanisms. Just to finish, to acknowledge the support mainly of the European Commission for different projects, specifically for Elena. Here you can see the, the website where you can find here the papers we are publishing. Of course, this is the effort of a lot of people. This was our last meeting in, in Granada, in Spain. And just to thank you very much for your attention.